for events. So mm. oh, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll get on. But um, tonight's speaker, Joachim Aramandera, is um, currently ROE in Edinburgh. He's originally from Montreal. He studied initially particle physics, um, did his degree and MS Masters in particle physics in Montreal, and then moved to Toronto to do his PhD in cosmology and then moved to Vancouver for his first postdoc and then moved to Edinburgh for his second postdoc. So he's certainly a traveller around the world and he was saying the distance between um, Vancouver and Edinburgh is about the same as the distance between Montreal and Vancouver, isn't it? <laughs> Uh, no, the uh, distance between Montreal, Montreal and Vancouver is much shorter than Edinburgh. Ah, right, yeah. Uh, yeah. St. St. John's is closer to Scotland than it is to Vancouver. Really? Yeah. So, <laughs> I've been over Canada myself. Uh, yeah. It's a country, country I must visit. I, must, uh, like, I do like travelling, so Canada's on the list. And as from Monday, he will be working for um, Liverpool John, not Johns Hopkins, John Moore. John Moore. <laughs> I can't give him two of them mixed up. As, um, on our permanent contract with SDFC, but tonight he'll be talking about his uh, work that he's been doing at ROE, and this is the main surge of your work at ROE, on mapping dark matter throughout the universe using billions of galaxies. So I'll hand over to Joachim and he can uh, tell us all about it. Yeah, I think the lights up is good. <laughs> um, thank you for coming and uh, listening to Dark Matter. I think this is, Dark Matter is one of the largest mysteries that we are facing in astronomy. We don't know what it is. We start to know where it is and today I'm going to tell you how it is, how it is that we, we kind of investigate uh, Dark Matter. Um, this image here is showing a galaxy with little tiles and this image is showing justice holding a balance which weights mass in here. And it's important tonight to remember that light is not the same as mass, and I will be talking mostly about mass, but a bit about light as well. So, um, what we see with our telescopes, what you see when you look at the sky, is light. You see light from the stars, light from objects, and light from our closest neighboring galaxy. This is Andromeda. That's Andromeda seen in optical light. But you can also point a different kind of telescope to the same object and learn about different properties. So this is Andromeda seen with a radio telescope. Andromeda seen with infrared. That's glow with the, what glows in infrared is mostly dust. So the light comes out of the stars, hits the dust particles, which then um, produce infrared uh, radiation, ultraviolet and X-ray. This is coming mostly from very hot gas. This is super hot gas. So the same object uh, emit lights in uh, different wavelengths and then uh, what we see in these different wavelengths are different parts of the object. We see dust, we see stars, we see gas. Um, that telescope here, do you know where it is, what it, what it is? <laughs> it's the, the, the telescope from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. That was a really game changer in cosmology and astronomy in the study of galaxies because it mapped millions of galaxies. So this here in the center is us, and then we are looking outwards from this map. So we're, this is not saying that we are at the center of the universe. We are at the center of the universe that we see. But uh, we, we look in all directions and we see loads and loads of galaxies. Uh, but, but they're not at random. They are, they're structure. We see filamentary structures, big clusters of region, clusters, clusters, and also what we call voids. And this whole thing, we, we named it the cosmic web because it looked a little, a little bit like um, a web. Um, this is a two-dimensional projection of a three-dimensional um, map of these galaxies. And what I'm about to show here is a movie, a 3D movie of what happens, what would, would it look like if you put all these galaxies into a big volume and fly through. So that's the SDSS fly-through. I think it's, it's worth seeing at least once. I'm not sure if you've seen that before, but here it is. Every galaxy that you see here is an actual galaxy that's been detected. And that's the best guess of the image. So the actual image that we put to that point is our best guess. But the position is exact. And we're flying through this super large volume 
way faster than the speed of light. Right? So in, in one of these objects, for the light to go from the end to the center is something like 10,000 years. Right? So this, this flight through is going very, very fast. But we see the structure, we see big filaments, we see big clusters here where you have hundreds, sometimes millions, uh, thousands of galaxies, thousands of galaxies that cluster together. And what is causing this clustering is the mass and gravity. Right? These galaxies are massive and gravity acts on the mass to cluster and make big objects. We are so small. <laughs> yeah. Could put that on the loop, right? Yeah. Like, like, like. The way Milky Way is and all that. I mean, you, you would think that these are stars, right? but no, at every point is made of billions of stars. It's, every point is a galaxy. And these are the people who contributed to the observation <coughs> and the makeup of this movie. <laughs> the SDSS. So, as I said, this was a big game changer because finally we had so many galaxies that we could study carefully uh, their clustering properties and try to infer something about how much mass there is, how much cl clustering there is, how much clumpy is the, the distribution of these galaxies. But what we've seen was light, the light of the galaxies, not their mass. We don't know what's their mass. And um, what we are mostly interested in is when we study dark matter, is this cosmic web. So this picture here was taken from numerical simulations in which we put billions of, galaxies, billions of points, which each represent something like a galaxy, um, and then let just gravity evolve. And th these filaments naturally form. This cosmic web emerges from these simulations, and you can try different, different simulations, different codes, different initial conditions, different amounts of dark matter, and we'll always end up with some filaments, some voids, in some clusters, and a galaxy would live at the mostly, most likely at the connection between these filaments. So where filaments meet, this is where you would have galaxies. Uh, however, so this is not a, an observation, this is something made up of a computer, and we would like to see this uh, in the real world, and we kind of saw it in the pictures with the galaxies, but the galaxies was not dark matter, this is just dark matter. And dark matter is most of the mass. So, one of the best ways to measure the mass is to use something called gravitational lensing. So in this picture here, that's the adult cluster 1689, there are more than 100,000 globular clusters in this, in this uh, object. They're not all shown here, this is uh, the, just the central region, but these big yellow blobs are very, very massive. And then what we see, aside from all these objects, are arclets, like street lines. So, Sometimes we see things like that when your glasses are dirty, so you can try to shake them off, and they just don't go away. <laughs> they are in the sky. So what is causing these arclets? This is the bending of light by mass. So the book is right there on the deep. It's a general relativity for the layman. So here is also a slide about that. Einstein told us and discovered more than 100 years ago um, that the mass of any object bends space-time. So the grid here, the mesh that we see in the background, it represents space-time. And where there's a big mass with hundreds of, of galaxies, the mesh is curved. You see this? Right. So this represents the curvature of space-time caused by mass. So what does that do? Well, if you are on Earth here and observe uh, towards these objects, uh, what you will see is that a background galaxy behind the mass will send light in every direction, missing Earth, so you don't see these lights. But the light that will go in a straight line straight to you is masked by uh, the central object, so you don't see the straight line. But you see light, the orange beams here, which would normally miss you, but now it's been focused back to you by the curvature of spacetime. So it's focusing back. So this whole thing acts like a convergent lens, like a glass, basically. You, you focusing the light back to um, your, your image plane here. So, what, uh, what does that mean is that the galaxy here, you can see it in this direction, but you can also see it in this direction. So the same object can, can be seen 
more than one time on the sky. Um, so here is one of the most famous objects, it's called the Einstein's Cross. So in the center is a foreground galaxy which is very massive, and around it is something which is behind it. And the light from the, the background, it's quasar, the, the light from the background quasar is going around the central mass and focus back to Earth. And then you can take a picture. This is something you can see, I think, with a 12-inch telescope. Um, if you, if you um, know where to look at, and then you hold it long enough. Um, and there's a ring, so the ring is basically just all the light in every direction going back to you, with four points which are a bit more intense. So that's called the N Einstein ring, and there are other Einstein rings which are uh, observed uh, by um, different telescopes. This is from Hubble's. And then, uh, basically, the more massive is the object, the larger is the ring. So a very large object has a very large ring. So, if we go back to this image, we can ask what kind of mass would create these rings. So you don't have the full, full exact ring, right? uh, because it's not one object, it's a cluster, so the geometry is not perfect, you don't have a circle, you have arclets. But you can still ask what kind of mass in the center uh, would cause all these arclets. And then you can come up with the mass. And then the mass looks like this. So the cloud here, the cloudy diffuse um, component here, shows the density of the mass that would create these arclets. So the center is bluer, means it's denser, there's more mass. And at the outskirt uh, is uh, less dense. So here is less blue than here. So it means it's less dense. And then, um, so you have a, a total mass of that object. And then if you compare this total mass to all the, the stars that we see, all the dust that we see, all the hot gas that we can see in the optical telescopes, in the uh, X-ray, in the infrared, and in the ultraviolet, we find that we are missing about 80% of all the mass. So this map has five times more, map that, more mass than all the other pictures we have of that object. So we call this, this invisible mass, we call it dark matter. Um, note that dark matter is transparent, so the light comes. The light, the light that's behind it comes through it, and you can see it. Um, that's not the only piece of evidence for that matter. Here are other pieces of evidence. So this is called the bullet cluster. It's another. Um, it's an, another evidence for dark matter. Um, the, this here has a galaxy. This here has a different galaxy. And then when you look at this image, the the all the stars. Well, it's hard to see because of the contrast, but there are loads of stars here loads of stars there. The pink here is hot gas. And this is, uh, when you see the, um, the shape of this hot gas, it means that there was a collision be be in between these two objects. This is after a collision, and the gas has been, it was um, on the stars, but now it's focused in the center. This gas was aligned with the stars, now it's focused with the center. And it's just because when these two objects collided together, the stars went through, but then uh, the gas collided. So it stayed in the center, so that's a sign of a collision. And then the blue shape here is again the matter map. And then we see that there's a lot of matter, again, five times more mass in the blue than in the stars, five times more mass in the blue than in the stars. So dark matter is also acting like a collisionless cloud that goes through and, and um, just as we think. There's no way to explain the missing mass uh, if you don't have dark matter. Um, you might have heard of rotation curves in the galaxy. So galaxies rotate, and then uh, if you can measure the velocity, the, ro the rotational velocities of the stars, and then you can look at the mass of the stars. And if you if you know the mass of the stars in the whole galaxy, um, then you, you compute what kind of mass would you need to hold the rotating stars around, and you find out that you need five times more. These stars, if there was no dark matter, should escape. It's just going around too fast. But if you have dark matter, with the same amount, then it holds everything together. And the profiles, everything looks fine. Um, the growth of galaxies. So initially, there were no galaxies in the universe. The galaxy appeared from billions of years of evolution. You need dark matter to explain the appearance of galaxies. Otherwise, it would have stayed very, very smooth. It would not exist. Um, this is also in the cosmic microwave background. So that's a, a map the first light that was ever emitted by the universe in the microwave. We've seen it with the telescope called Planck here. And all of these little fluctuations that you see here 
they're not random. There's a lot of structure in them. There are big patches, smaller patches, and the amount of fluctuations depends on how much matter, how much dark matter, how much normal matter you have, and then to explain these fluctuations, you need the same amount of dark matter. But this is a completely different telescope, uh, probing a completely different part and epoch of the universe. Still, you need the same amount of, of uh, dark matter. So there are overwhelming evidence that um, that we need dark matter in the universe, and that there is. Uh, if you have more questions about um, ideas of could we do it without dark matter, we can talk about that later. But from now, I assume that we agree that there is dark matter in the universe. And uh, here are key questions I'm trying to answer. Where is dark matter? How much there is? How clumpy it is? Does it evolve? And then once we have an answer for most of these, maybe we can ask the question, what it is? So that's the real, that's the real thing. We don't know what it is. We are not able to create dark matter in the lab. We are not able to destroy what we see in the sky. We don't know, we cannot collide dark matter, we cannot play with it. So we don't know what it is, and we'd like to know. Um, and one of the best ways is to study dark matter with observations. And if we had access to the full sky, and analyze the full sky, uh, that's the best measurement we could ever have on dark matter. The challenge here is that this was a very special place in the sky. It's a big cluster with loads of mass. So we have these big, big strong arcs. Um, typically, if you look at the sky, you don't have a cluster. You have something like a very empty part with some galaxies in the, in the background, but no large structure in your face. But still, you would like to measure the dark matter that lives in this area. But you don't have a very strong signal. You don't have arcs. You have small arcs, a small effect. So instead of talking about strong gravitational lensing, we talk about weak gravitational lensing. So it's a small effect, it's a weak distortion of the shapes of the galaxy. So you don't have the full arc, you have a little stretch, a little distortion, maybe a little focusing effect. But once you start having millions and millions of galaxies, this effect adds up and you can try to dig it up and uh, measure something. So um, uh, this is what we're trying to do now. We are on Earth with our telescope. There is a background source, which are the millions of galaxies, and in the middle there is a lens. So that's an optic table. The light goes through from the light bulb, from the light source, through the lens, towards the observer. Originally it's red in circle, now it becomes pink and square. That means that there's a slight change in properties in the light. And you'd like to know what is the lens that caused that change of property. You measure property, you measure distortion, focusing effect, and you, you want to solve what for the lens that creates this on the full sky. It's a bit complicated because you don't have one lens, you have loads of lenses, which are your filaments and your clusters and all the voids, so everything acts as a lens. Voids are negative lens that diverges your light, so you need to think about them as well. They have a lot. The galaxies they live in the large-scale structure, so they're not just behind it, they are in it, so it means that they're correlated and it, it's, it's, the, there's all sorts of secondary signal, fake signal because of that. You think things are aligned, but it's just because of gravity, it's not because of lensing, so it's a bit more complicated. Um, your optical camera is imperfect, so sometimes you have an image, you think it's, it's stretched by uh, gravity, but actually it's just your, your camera which has an effect in it, so you, or maybe there's a satellite track that went, and then you oh, that's a big, big shape, but it's not a galaxy, it's a satellite track. Uh, then there's the atmosphere, so uh, what looks like a point it becomes diffuse, we call it the point spread function. You've seen that, that's a resolution limit of your telescope, and you have, if you have a lot of air, uh, that air will, sp will spread out, so a star is not a point, a star is a blob, and then so your galaxy is not nicely stretched, is a blob, which maybe is a bit stretched. So the whole problem becomes more complicated. But still, we did it. <laughs> so, so here it is, uh, in a little sketch. In the universe, without dark matter, your background galaxy, what's behind them, you could think that their alignment is random. So there's no preferred direction in the universe. The shape of the galaxies do not all align left. They are randomly distributed. Uh, but if you put in the front a bit of mass, everything will acquire a slight alignment around the mass. So here it is, everything is random, 
and here there's a little 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 component. So each of these galaxies have picked up something small, and you can think of it as um, like an Einstein ring around this, but it's weak, so on one object you don't see it, but collectively they make up a little bit like this ring, and the more massive is this object, the, more, the, the better you can find out that ring. So, how do we measure that object? How, how do we measure these Einstein's rings on the full sky? So, we better start somewhere. So, the first time that's been done uh, for the purpose of measuring dark matter, how much it is, how quick it is, that was with the Canada France Hawaii telescope. Uh, and they had this CFHT lens, it's a lensing survey. So, this is uh, the telescope at the top of Mount Hawaii. And then there's a bit of snow. But here, that's that snow. That's clouds, right? You're above the clouds. So it's very convenient when your telescope is above the clouds because you don't have clouds above you. You see the stars and the clouds are for people living down there. So you have very, very nice observations and you have uh, the, the, at the top of, uh, the, of that mountain there's less air above you. So it means that you have less, uh, a smaller um, diffusion of light in the atmosphere. And then, um, so that program was divided in four seasons, so four little patches, W4, W3, W2, and W1. W is for wide, so wide part, wide field, one, two, three, four. There's one for each season. That means that any time of the year, there was one of these patches that was over you. So you could point it there and make your observation. Uh, for your reference, here I've circled Orion. So here's a little belt, regal, images. Um, so, um, so that's that's a program. In each of the four patches, we've pointed the telescope, which was uh, one square degree. It was a, it's called a mega cam. It was back then, ten years ago, one of the, of the best camera ever built for astronomy. One megapixel. That was uh, one of these squares. Then we tiled up W1 with all these observations. W2, W3, W4, and in total, we had 150 square degrees of observations. Uh, that contain 12 million galaxies. And we, for each of these galaxies, we measure their shape. And we try to measure their distance as well. That was one of the hardest things to do. And then, so we had a lot of data. So back then, that was very, very uh, massive amount of data. And then the geometry we knew, so uh, all the, that's the mathematics basically. And then we put that into a big computer, and then we press go, compute the map, and then solve for every point uh, in these fields, and then we hope that we didn't mess up. And then here we got the first maps of that matter. So W1, 2, 3, and 4. Uh, and then the blobs here, where it's white, it means it's very dense. And when it's black, it means that you don't see much. It does not mean that there's no dark matter, but it's buried in the noise. So you don't, you don't see it. Maybe there is, but it's definitely less dense. So you can think of it as density maps. So white is dense, um, black is less dense. And then there, there are a little bit of filamentary structures, clusters, and then uh, if you align the, the, the galaxies that you see, they fall mostly on these white spots. So big clusters, they follow these white spots. Not perfectly because there's a bit of noise, it's not a perfect measurement, but clearly these maps contain a lot of information. So here, that, that was how we did for the first time a map of dark matter with millions of galaxies. Title of my talk. Um, what's next? What? So there are more maps. Um, this is the big sister survey. So we use the same camera, same telescope, but we look at an area which was five times larger. It was called the Redshift Cluster Sequence Survey. And we had more maps, which same kind of structures. Red is very dense. And we have these filaments, blobs. And then um, the current generation, this is from uh, uh, the group I'm currently working with, the Kilo the Great Survey Collaboration, based in the UK, in Leiden, also in the Netherlands, um, in Germany as well. And so this is another map. And then the, the here, the, uh, the purple here is dense, the white-ish is less dense, and the yellow lines are like cuts. So anything which is inside a circle is very dense. So you kind of cut this out so you can better see the fainter point. Um, but these are more mass maps. This is from a Japanese collaboration called the Hyper Supreme Col um, Camera Collaboration. Um, it's one of their maps. They have seven more like that. And 
this is um, the, the grain is much finer. They had much better resolution because their camera is just fantastic, and they had many, many more galaxies uh, that went fainter. So with more galaxies, you have a better re map reconstruction. Um, this is from um, a US-led uh, experiment called the Dark Energy Survey Collaboration, and it's also a map. Uh, this here has been scaled down to fit in, in, in the screen, but it actually is um, about 20 times as large as this one. So it's, it's a very, very, very big map. Um, and they are all consistent together. So the clumpiness and the abundance, it's all consistent. Uh, and yet you're looking at different parts of the sky. Uh, so, put, to put number on these maps, so the kilodegree survey catalog had an area of 450 square degrees. The, half, the, 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 the full moon is half a degree on the side. So, put a reference. Um, so, uh, 14 million galaxies. The Dark Energy Survey, after one year, had uh, 1,300 galaxies, uh, 1,300 uh, square degrees with 26 million galaxies. And then, um, the, the Japanese team had 137 square degrees, so it's the smallest area of these. But they had 9 million in that small area, so it's way denser. That explains why the map are so deep and so uh, detailed. Um, now that we have these maps, they're very pretty, they're very beautiful. We're convinced that they're dark, there's dark matter, but what else can we learn about that matter aside that it exists? So let's try to do some cosmology. And for this, we really need a way to interpret the data. So it's just interpretation, how much, how much clumpiness, how much, how do we do that? Well, it turns out that numerical simulations are really, really good at making up these lenses. So the map of dark matter, the distribution of dark matter is, is well modeled on computers. So what uh, I did for seven years of my life was to run, to put billions of particles in a computer. Actually, it's more like 512 computers were working in parallel, then you evolve these particles uh, from a high, high distance object all the way making up all these lenses coming up closer to you and as you go from earlier time all the way to today these distributions evolve. So the clumpiness and the clustering properties they change. And uh, things are more clumpy when you have more time. So here this is clumpier than this. So in the end you can stack up all these lenses together um, in these simulations, I can specify the cosmology, which means how much dark matter, how much normal matter, how much dark energy, how much clumpiness do I put in all of that, um, uh, what's the value of the Hubble parameter, all of these I can specify in, in, uh, in these simulations, and then I can do, uh, I can um, send photons in my computer simulations from the observer back through all these lenses, all the way to the source, and compute along this trajectory all the, the, the weak lensing properties, how much convergence, how much shear does these photons have acquired in their trajectory. So I kind of go backwards. I go from us back to the source, where in the real world, the photons go from the source all the way to us. But in the end, it's, it's doing the same. Um, this is what these look like. So in a simulation, this is a convergence map. So a region here, where it's white, has a lot of convergence, so there's a mass there. There's a cluster that converges, that converges to light all the way to you. These are gamma 1 and gamma 2 Greek letters. They are, they, they are designed to capture the shearing, so the distortion in shape. Uh, so these would produce the, these arclets. So gamma 1 measure the distortion vertically and horizontally, and gamma 2 measure distortions along the diagonals. So the same object converges and produces the shear in these two directions. So this is what a computer gives you for a given cosmology. Um, so basically I connect the theory, the input cosmology, with the observation. Because I can, I can put the galaxies in the real world at these positions, ask if I had a galaxy there, what would be the shear? Shear 2, shear 1, and kappa. Then look in the world, make some measurement, and compare. Um, I can also make simulations where dark energy is different. So, in the standard model of cosmology, we think that most likely the dark energy is the cosmological constant that Einstein just took and put in the, in the basket. So, um, but it turns out that we need that to explain the evolution of, of the large scale structures. So, dark energy is 
uh, something still we don't know what it is, but most likely it's constant everywhere. It's not evolving. It's no continuous. It's just one thing, one number you can put in an equation that fixes everything. And if you put that in a simulation, it looks like this. If instead you allowed um, dark energy to evolve, the same initial would evolve and look like this. So you see, it's not quite the same, but there are structures which are clearly at the same place. But this, the clumpiness is different, things have moved a little bit around, but it's kind of a bit similar. So which one is the most likely? Well, this is, um, it's, it's hard to find because in, the, in these simulations, you don't reproduce the Milky Way, you don't reproduce Andromeda, you don't have the local group, you just have a universe which has this amount of dark matter, this kind of dark energy. So you don't know uh, locally where are the objects, That's, you cannot trust that, but statistically the ensemble will, will look right. So we have millions of galaxies in our data set, we can have millions of galaxies in these simulations, so you can compare the ensembles. How close are the ensembles? How much global lensing do I have in the data, in the simulations? And then it's kind of how many clusters will I have in the simulations, in the data? You compare how many filaments, how clumpy everything is, and then you can uh, do a kind of a Cinderella game, basically. So you have, you vary the cosmology in your simulations, you have, say, 100 simulations then these are all the girls in the village and then you come up with the data the data is that shoe then you try to fit the data to all these feet and then you find the, the most likely Cinderella so the, the most likely uh, simulation that best fits the data will be your, what your measurement will tell you so uh, it's not easy because each of these simulations are expensive um, but basically this is what we do our dark matter analysis method we create fake data or mock data with our simulations, and then in the real data, we have galaxy positions, we have their right ascensions, their declinations, Z is for their redshift, so basically it's a measure of their distance to you, and then we have a convergence and a distortion. So for every galaxy in your, um, in, your, uh, in your data set, real data, you have these properties, and then you can use the same position, the same redshift, in your simulation. Then you say, well, if my simulation has this amount of that matter, what will be the convergence? What will be the shear? And you redo this for all your simulations. You vary the input cosmology, you redo this every step. And then in the end, you try to come up with a comparison way. We call this a summary statistics. So it could be uh, just counting objects, for instance. Um, and then you find the best fit cosmology. And then here you go, know, you have a handle on how much dark matter and how clumpiness, how much clumpiness you have in the real world by looking at what you put in your simulation. Um, so I am going to show you my the last data set that I'm using uh, now from the kill degree survey. Uh, now that survey has just just completed a few months ago, so we have 13 also 1300 square degrees on the sky. This is uh, so this here, the black rectangle is all of our observation. This is the status of the observations uh, two years ago, but we filled this with all these little tiles. So this is all black now. And the red here, these are the galaxies from the SDSS. SDSS is the movie I showed at the very beginning. So there is an overlap. That's important. There's an overlap between SDSS and the data, the galaxy from the Kilo degree survey. And the kill the these data sets are behind SDSS galaxies, so you can do you, so. These will so the, the data from SDSS will act as lens, and these will be sources. And you can we'll, I'll show you what we do with that afterwards. But uh, all that is public. So if you want to download the catalogs, it's all public. The the shapes are public, the positions, so you can make beautiful maps. The, I think some of the pictures as well are public. So. Um, uh, so this is what I'm, I've been playing with for the last few years. And uh, so I, I talked in the past about counting objects, um, or what I, I call like summary statistics. Here, um, what I've been doing for the last year is something called peak count, something which is pretty simple. Um, in this map, there are big peaks. 
you, if you imagine these are mountains and the whites are higher and black are lower, these are the highest mountains. So in this in this uh, in this map here, I have eight big peaks, and then I have a number of orange peaks which are a medium height, and then I have a low like way more smaller peaks. So counting peaks as a function of their size is one way to look at data. So one way to look at the map. So this is a map of the of the dark matter. So how much big peaks of dark matter do I have? And then you can do the same in the data, in the simulations. And it turns out that if you have more dark matter, and if it started to be, if it started more clumpy uh, at the earlier time, in the end you'll have bigger peaks. So if you have more dark matter, you have more gravity, you have bigger peaks. So what we can do is to measure for a bunch of simulations the number of peaks. So this is small peaks, this is large peaks. So this should be. Uh, size of the peaks, right? Sorry, the, the, it's overlapping. <laughs> so the size of the peaks, so big peaks, so these will be the, the green will be here, you just count how much you have, and then the small will be here, you count how much you have, and the red lines here are simulations where you have a lot of dark matter which is very clumpy, and the blue here are simulations where you have only a little bit of dark matter which is not clumpy. And then you, you measure the number of peaks in all these simulations in between. So that's 175 independent simulations. And then you do the same with the data. The data is in green here. And then you can find what is the best simulation that best fit all these data points. And you see that there's more than one that fit within the error bars. So the, these error bars here, these are, that's the uncertainty you have in your measurement. So whenever you do a measurement, these error bars are as important as the central point because if you have very very small error bar you are confident about your measurement and if they're large you are less confident so here there are kind of maybe medium sized so tens of models satisfy these error bars but some models are clearly rejected so this is rejected rejected so from this measurement you can measure the clumpiness and the abundance of dark matter so you're doing basically a cosmological measurement and it turns out that you need something like 30% of the full energy budget of the universe must be dark matter from that measurement. It's pretty good. It's a good measurement. I like to think about that. I've measured that. <laughs> um, yeah, I just said that. Can you learn something else with these maps? Yes, you can learn something else. So what I was about to say is that um, we have an overlap between the galaxies measure with the, the, the SDSS telescope and the, the galaxies measure with the kilodegree survey. So these are behind, these are in front. So we can use these as lenses, these as sources in our little optical bench and find out what is the total mass that's actually close to the galaxies. Because these only show the light. You don't know what's the mass around that, that object, but you know that Normally galaxies live within a cluster of dark matter. They live within like a big blob of dark matter. So maybe if you look at the, the lensing around that galaxy, but then you don't look at the galaxy, just look at that place as a marker of somewhere where you could have mass. And then you make a, a lensing measurement where you measure Einstein's rings around this, this foreground lens. And then um, as a function of the distance, so this is how much how much uh, Einstein ring you have in here, in here, in here, and then you can find something as um, the total mass as a function of distance to the center. So you're basically measuring the profile of the dark matter halo. So how much do you have at the center, how much do you have at the edge, and as you go from the center to the edge, what's the density? And the density is dropping, and this is what we measure. So the black points are the measurement of uh, how much, what's the strength of the Einstein ring as a function of, of the angle. So here's small angle, very close to the center, and this is large angles. So 60 arc minutes is a degree. So this is a half moon, a full moon basically. It's, full, uh, it's two full moons, 60 as you have the um, 60 arc minutes. So we are going to uh, 120, that's 200 arc minutes. So this is roughly three degrees. We are measuring around 
every galaxy of SDSS <coughs> three degrees in all directions measuring Einstein rings <coughs> and then the strength decreases and then we came up with a, a theoretical model that's the red line which best fit these points and that's uh, basically your profile of the dark matter halo so if you come back to that image so the, 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 um, the, the cloud here that presents the dark matter mass and it we, we said at the beginning it was denser in the, in the center and uh, fainter at the, at the edge, but here now we've measured it. So we've measured at the center, it's higher, the density drops, eventually we put a number, then we have this profile in terms of density. <coughs> so something else we've learned. Um, and if you have um, um, different models of dark matter, sometimes you can think of dark matter as we said it's collision mess. Well, maybe since there's an, a different Model dark matter, where uh, maybe dark matter has a temperature, a large temperature, a small temperature, maybe uh, maybe dark matter is allowed to collide. So if you, you start to have these different um, models of dark matter, the profile will change a lot. So if dark matter is warm, it will diffuse more. So in the center, it will not be allowed to be as dense as here. So a warm dark matter will move more. It will be flatter in the center and then here it will catch up. So you can learn a bit about what dark matter is, a little bit, with measuring the profile like that. Um, it's hard to measure the profile for one object. So we, we were talking about all the, the, the overlapping sources between SDSS and the Tildegore survey. That's something like, so this is a, a combination of something like 1,000 measurements. Individually, they, they go in all directions, but when we take the mean or the average, like they converge this this nice uh, distribution. So um, statistically, that's what dark matter does. Um, what's coming up? These are the two big surveys which will um, see light in only a few years. This is LSST, the Large Synoptic Sky Telescope, um, and this is underground in Chile. It's almost done, uh, it's almost ready uh, to, to, to start and look at the, at, the, at the sky. This is Euclid, it will be uh, put in space at the Lagrange point 1, I think. And both will measure roughly 1500 square degrees, so it's kind of a third of the sky with about a billion galaxies each. So that's a lot of galaxies, a lot of data. Um, so you can think that, uh, so that's the density, the expected density of galaxies. So if you think of one arc minute square, that's very small, you'll find 27 galaxies. So if you look at the full moon, basically, in the full moon you have something like 20,000 galaxies. So that's, you better resolve these objects with a good camera because you'll have a lot. <laughs> but they will, so this is, the LCC has an 8 meter um, diameter mirror and then the, 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 the camera is roughly from me to you, that's the size of the camera it's a 2 meter diameter with um, 30 terapixels so it's a big beast so it will do the job, it was designed to do that so I'm very looking forward to I, I'm part of that group and will most likely uh, become part of that group as well but that's, uh, that's where we're going to go. So this telescope will have maps of dark matter which will be really, really looking good and perhaps maps as a function of time as well. That's the next step is to have early map, medium map and late time, late universe maps so we can see the evolution of the dark matter with time and ideally, um, if you think back of the flight room of the galaxy that we see, the movie that we saw at the, at the beginning of, of this presentation uh, so, for, for this movie to happen, you, you need to have a catalog of all the galaxies, then you fly through that. Well, with these telescopes, we'll have a catalog of dark matter in the sky, and fly through that. So, I think in a few years from now, maybe in 12 years, that will be completed, and we'll fly through dark matter densities. That will be amazing, I'll be very happy when that will happen. And then, um, so that's um, pretty much the end of my talk. So, we have partly answer questions about dark matter. Where is dark matter? Well, we've seen now. We've seen the first maps, it's going there. Uh, most likely, we will find lots of dark matter around galaxies. They both are massive and they trace each other, but there's five times more. 
So when you think about the galaxy, think about a halo of dark matter, which is five times heavier. So a galaxy typically has, say, um, 100 billion stars. So you can think that there's five times more in terms of mass of dark matter. It's pretty, pretty massive. Um, how clumpy it is well, is something like as clumpy as the galaxy distributions on large scale. So you have filaments, you have voids, you can think of the, the, the filament, the, the cosmic web, that's how clumpy that is. So it's not the same everywhere. Um, would we exist without that matter? Well, no! You need that matter to create the galaxy. So thank you, dark matter, for existing. I'm happy to be living. Um, is dark matter evolving? Well, as an entity, if it's a particle, we don't know if the particle evolves. But what we know is that the distribution, where it is, that evolves. Because gravity acts on the distribution and makes it more and more clumpy, so forming larger and larger objects. So the distribution of that matter evolves with time. Can it pass through us? Well, yes, we are in the galaxy. There's a lot of dark matter around us. So it, just like the neutrinos, just like the microwaves, just like the radio waves, we are traversed by dark matter particles. Um, every day. And then, um, it does nothing. We're fine. Uh, unanswered questions now. What is dark matter? That's the, it's the holy grail. We don't know yet. Um, where does it come from? We don't know. Or how was it created? We don't know. Can we create any? Not at the moment. Well, not that we know. Maybe we are creating some at uh, LHC in the in Switzerland and France that we're not aware of because we cannot detect it. Can we destroy it? Not that we know. Can we use it? Not that we know. And uh, any other questions you might have? No, it's a good time. Thank you. and the semi-minor axis. That's all we know. When we say we... Who, who Me and my team. So I, I actually, I did not make this measurement, but I'm part of a team, and there are a, a, there's a task force in our team which is doing shape measurement. So, so it's a human who's going to sit and looking at every one of these, like, logs and kind of... No. Okay, I was going <laughs> to well, say. There's, there's a bit of that, but there's, it's, it's all mostly automated. So uh, from the pictures to the catalogs of galaxies, there's a... a, a we call it a data reduction pipeline. So there is someone who looks at the pictures and then every object is measured one, more than once. So we we, we, do, we make vittering, we look at different angles, the, uh, different colors, we revisit it more than once um, during the seasons. So then for every object we have say five observations but they're all like a bit shifted. So the first thing software does is shift it back and then uh, on the stack or we call it the co-add, on the co-add you measure the shape. And then, so basically, that means that there's a software that goes through this, these stacked images, look at something that maybe could be a, a bright enough object, there's a threshold above that oh, object, you fly that, I want to measure the shape around that, and there's a software which goes in these candid catalogs and find uh, ellipses, basically, and you fit for the shape. Because that's what I was kind of, because I work with software, so I don't trust it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, no, so, so I was just kind of curious, like, how, how confident you can be in, like, these millions of me measurement that that they are well, yeah, it's, it's, a good, it's a good question. So we have, for every object, we have a measurement of these shapes mm. plus the uncertainty on that measurement for every object. And we are very confident on the uncertainty that it captures any mistake it could have done. And most of these objects are very, very faint. So we're talking about maybe 8 pixels, like sometimes like 8 pixels, and you try to find an ellipse in 8 pixels, which contains noise. 
<laughs> like just pixel noise and a bit of the atmosphere and PSF and spread, so it's, it's, it's very tricky. But what's, what's the distribution of shapes telling you? I mean, if a galaxy looks circular, it's face on, if it's more tilted, it's going to look increasingly elliptical and it becomes a straight line. Mm -hmm. So, what is it actually telling you? There's, there's so many look like the circles, there's so many look elliptical, there's so many are on straight lines, but what is that actually telling, telling you when you get the statistics on that? So for one object it tells you nothing, because you have no way of knowing, if you see something which is like that, is it a galaxy which is round and rotated, it's yeah. edge on, or is it something which is circular, very far away has been stretched. Yes. So you don't know, yeah. um, but what you know is that once you have 1000, if there's no dark matter, their shapes will be at random. So if you start looking for correlations, you should see nothing. So it's really, it's, it's a correlation measurement. So when we look at rings, it's basically looking how <coughs> this object aligns with respect to the center, and this aligns with respect to the center, so it's a correlation measurement. <coughs> so you're looking for a pattern, it's like a pattern recognition. Right. There will be no pattern without that matter. I'm, I'm curious about this comping. Um, it, it, it's a function of time then, since the big bang, that the, the prompting has increased. Yes. Right, and we can see that with further and go back as, as a method user. But is, is, does clumpiness, does it vary across the sky? You know, is, is there another variation of clumpiness? And my other question is, what ultimately will happen? You know, how far will the clumpiness go? Will it evolve into something, you know? Extremely black hole of the dark. Well, yeah. Black hole of the dark. Two very good questions. So, uh, the clumpiness, if you look on small scales, yeah. say you're on Earth, Earth is extremely dense. And then, if you look just next to Earth, it's interstellar medium, interplanetary is extremely undense. Yeah. So, on that kind of scale, the clumpiness is huge. Yeah, so if, if you increase and zoom out, and you zoom out and you see that like, you have a volume that contains 50,000 galaxies and the clumpiness on that scale and the clumpiness on that same volume here yeah. is similar. Right. It's very similar. So you, but you need to go on large scale. So that's it's often called the field of large scale structures. That means that you ignore anything which has to do with galaxy groups and smaller. Yeah. And to answer your second question, um, what happens when you, when you let gravity evolve and evolve, it becomes more and more clumpy. But there's a limit to that, because dark matter cannot cool. And that's very important, because um, if you don't cool, it means that you will go through, and you will basically go through and uncollide, and then you go, and you'll bounce like a spring, basically. So you cannot form something that's denser. But if you can cool, suppose that you have normal matter that goes through, it collides, emits light, or emits heat, emits something. And then so it means it has less energy. So gravity will have more power, and it, it will become denser. So, as far as we know, yeah, that's better. Say, do we know that it can't cool? Do we know that it's not radiating something? Or even gravitational waves? So, we've, we've been looking for a radiation emitted from regions of uh, dark matter over density. So, these big maps that we've, shot, we've seen, we've been combining these maps with um, maps of uh, gamma rays. Because we thought there are many models where if you have uh, two dark matter particles, they can maybe collide and emit. And given their energy, they should be emitting high energy photons. So we look in, in gamma rays with the Fermi Lab Telescope mm -hmm. and found no correlation. So we have upper limits on the rate of transfer. Mm -hmm. But so far, uh, we haven't found that. But, but theory, really, that's interesting and it's, it's appealing. Yeah. Do you know anything about the actual time that dark matter appeared? Because when, when the universe formed, it was initially just the energy. And that cooled sufficiently to start producing matter. So, did dark matter appear at the same time as oh, yeah. mm -hmm. protons and electrons? That's a question we don't know. <laughs> we don't know. So we have we have model for the baryogenesis, so the ap the appearance of the first protons and neutrons. And, and neutrons. We have a model for leptogenesis, so the first the appearance of the first electrons and neutrinos. We have nothing about dark matter genesis because we don't know what it is. So we need to know. We need to know at least the mass of the, of the, the particles, if it's a particle. We have a model, otherwise, yeah, but you, there's you no sign that it appeared, but it was there. <coughs> it, it looks like, so the, the best, 
the best um, the best estimate we have is can I do that? Oh no. Oh, it's moving on the screen now. Oh. Uh, <laughs> what is it on that? Oh, yeah. yeah I mean, look there. <laughs> so, uh, maybe you can find the, the, the map where I showed the, um, the slide where I showed the, the, the microwave, the method of microwave stuff. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask about the cosmic microwave background, because it's got fluctuations. This one, if you can bring this one to the screen. So, what we know is that when the, when the universe was um, 400,000 years old, it's roughly 14 billion years away from us, um, so very young state, um, it had all the signs that, you, that dark matter was there since the beginning. So, yeah, so you're just saying that the fluctuations and the background radiation are, are implying this dark matter. Yeah, since the beginning. Since the beginning. Since the beginning yeah. is, is that also the reason why it goes into that kind of web shape, like uh, the, the, the fluctuations? So the amount, well, the, the, the amount of web, of webliness, <laughs> depends on the, the, the amount of clumpiness originally that you have. Right. Uh, but um, um, where it was born will will not influence much because it is, you still have 13 billion years so if it was born, if, if dark matter uh, appeared uh, at time zero or at um, say 200,000 years old you'll, you, you will not be able to see it in the filament but you would see it in the, in the mass how, how come it doesn't, for example, just form blobs? how come it has like strands that, that sort of connect uh -huh. all, all of them? so the, if you start it's a good question, it's about the mathematics of gravity a bit. But if you have say, a big volume, which is perfectly homogeneous, mm -hmm. and then you let gravity evolve, it will be frozen. Because mm -hmm. it's perfectly homogeneous, there's nowhere where gravity will say, I want to go there. So it's just all in balance. But it's a very fragile balance, and if you make a little bit, a little place um, denser, everything will start to fall towards that place. And so that's if you have one. Yeah. If you have multiple places which are a bit dense, multiple places which are a bit undense, globally what happens is that you will not fall into a point, you will first fall into a sheet, then the sheet will fall into a filament, then the filaments will fall to point. It's like there's a hierarchy in clustering, basically. So that's been, that's been uh, first derived in mathematics by a Russian called Zeldovich in 1970. And then we've seen that in simulations, we've seen that in the sky as well. And so basically that's why. It's because there's this, um, it's like a fast track of, close, of, uh, of um, colli coll colliding and clustering. Mm. You said that you can't cool dark matter. Yes. Um, how do you know that? And if you can't cool it, do we know what would happen if you heated it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, we, so we, we don't know, we don't know for sure, because we know very little about the properties of dark matter. But when we measured the, the profile, but this is still not responding. No, it's, okay, it's like the two. Can, can we maybe unplug the projector? Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, we're trying that. So the, one of the last measurements I've shown was the profile of dark matter. Mm -hmm. And what I say is that if dark matter was a, able to cool, <laughs> that's insane. Okay. Oh, it's back. Yeah. Yeah. So if you could cool dark matter, or if dark matter was able to cool. It would be allowed to form very dense structure, and you would see it in the profile. So the last the last um, graph that I showed was measuring the profile of dark matter. If um, dark matter was able to cool, it would go very very dense at the center. So so far, what we know is that it's consistent with collisionless, which means impossible to cool dark matter. You need to have collisions to be able to cool. And what is it? Do you know if can you meet it? Same, same thing, so okay. heating and cooling is the same, you need, right. to, you need to have a way to interact. Right. You, throw, you throw energy, you throw a photon, you throw a particle, and then it will collide and heat. Or they will collide, the two particles will collide, emit something and cool. Okay. So you need to have an interaction channel, which goes both ways, and there, there are none at the moment that we're aware of. So. Do those web strands like, move around, or are they quite fixed? Like, does 
like you start to start quite homogeneous and then they sort of form these drums or do these drums move about or yeah, everything moves. Yeah, everything moves. Move. Yeah, you can think of a even the whole web, um, the clusters will eventually maybe fall on one another. It means that you have filament reconnection. Mm -hmm. There's a, there, this whole science about uh, um, studying the connectivity between these nodes. So it connects with math and uh, topology. Mm -hmm. yes. What kind of time scale does it lose? Um, billions of years. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's been very, you wouldn't see it in our lifetime. <laughs> All right, so this is the map. Yeah, thank you. Wrong oh. <laughs> button. So this is the map. So the light, so the light has reached us ten years ago, um, and five years ago, but uh, it was emitted when the universe was four hundred thousand years old, thirteen point five ish billion years old, and in, in these maps are all these little fluctuations, contain information about the amount of dark matter, amount of light, the the, the Hubble parameter, the clumpiness, and then this clumpiness here is um, so there's large scales clumpiness and small scales clumpiness. So we have these big blobs. How much big blobs you have, how much small blobs you have, all of that contains information about dark matter, about normal matter, and then um, and then um, you, you need to have uh, five times more dark matter, and it needs to be there for as long as we can tell for the same duration as the normal matter because there's, the kind of, there's a kind of interaction between, between dark matter and normal matter and that interaction is uh, showing no sign that one happened after the other <coughs> so as far as we know it's been there since time zero or very close maybe time one minute <laughs> might be pushing our luck but could you go to one, the picture which showed like the lens in the um, yeah, ring uh, yeah yeah um, oh. This one? No. Uh, I guess yeah, with that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so yeah, that one. And um, so, like, when you see pictures like this, you can see some of the lensing, like you know, pointing out those arcs. But it looks like, you, oh yeah, yeah, we can see a lot easier now. So you can see some of those arcs, but it also looks like you can see just normal uh, galaxies. Mm -hmm. Seemingly behind it, I'm just not quite understanding if they are whether they are behind or if they're actually in front. And if they are behind them, why are they not being bent by the gravity or anything? Right. So I think most of the points here belong to the foreground object. So it means closer to you and to us. And then uh, the, 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 these arcs are definitely behind. Yeah. And then there are. Uh, uh, I don't know which one are there, but I know that even some arcs, I think this one and this one, they actually come from the same object. Can you measure the redshifts of those yeah. arcs? Yeah, so, so what people have done is to point a spectrometer at these arcs specifically. And then they find like how much iron there is, how much um, the double the sodium slits there are, and then so they find out the, the chemistry of each of these lines with the spectrum, and then the spectrum has been redshifted with the distance and the expansion of the universe. And for some of them, they have the exact same redshift and abundance of every every single element. So that's a, that's a smoking gun for this is the same object. Mm -hmm. So you have multiple objects which have been multiple times. So for example, there's a couple of galaxies on the left there. There's like yeah. um, a bit 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 to the upper right. There's like a yeah yeah. So there's that, that flat one, and then one below yeah. it. There's like a spiral. Yeah. Bit. So this is close. So that's closer than the whole blob of this one. No no. This, uh, um, Hard to tell, but it's clearly not behind. So these arcs, these arcs are very, very far away. So you would not so be able yeah, to resolve. Yeah, so I can understand those being far away, but the, the globe of the cluster, I thought that's what has the the, the gravity that's bending the light. I'm just yes. not. And so I imagine what how I'm imagining it is that those two galaxies are beha further away than this globe of cluster. So I'm wondering why the light wouldn't bend from those. Maybe they're not as far away. Not, it, it, so for, um, for the lensing effect to be maximal, you need to have the lens halfway through you and the source. And from, from the, 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 the angular size of this object, I would say this is at least at, at the same distance or just behind it or just in front, but comparable distance. I so, it's a huge. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, so you, you need to have a very far object, distance object.
So something like this is close by as well. Mm -hmm. the, so these like small objects, these are the things which are shared. Mm -hmm. Could you in theory see the same galaxy in two different places? Yes. Yes. I think I don't know exactly which one it is, but that's what I was uh, discussing before. So in this image, I know some arcs. I, I, what I said before was I think this one and this one. But some arcs are from the same object. It would be fascinating if a supernova went off in the, the galaxy just way behind you. You'd see the arcs all lighting up at the same point. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's an argument. It will happen. It will happen. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway, uh, uh, um, if there's no other urgent question, you can talk to your <laughs> king um, over tea, and I think we'll probably get the, uh, the tea going and uh, get ourselves organised. Um, so, once again, if we could say thank you to Peter. in two weeks' time uh, would have been uh, the late, great Dave Gavin.